Okay, chap. So we go to the question. This is of course a basal cell carcinoma. Etiology, UV radiation, sun exposure, or tanning beds, photosensitizing agents like tetracyclines or thiazide diuretics in combination with sun exposure, chronic arsenic exposure, and ionizing radiation. Uh, you sometimes have phenotypic traits if you people with light skin, light colored hair, and light eye colored uh, tend to have increased tendency to basal cell carcinoma. If the patient has a personal history of basal cell carcinoma, they are more prone to it. And these are usually people who come in at younger uh, age. There are genetic, some genetic variants predisposing genetic variants. It's beyond the ambit of uh, immediate discussion right now. You have inherited disorders. Uh, what we do is when we are doing the skin in oncology, we'll uh, do that for you. And of course, if the patient has had immunosuppression. On histological examination, common findings of BCC are nodules or strands of atypical basaloid cells that show nuclear palisading, cellular ap apoptosis, and scattered mitotic activity in the dermis. Chaps, what I would suggest is make it a point, and that is very important, make it a point, please, to read up about uh, the histological features and be comfortable with the histological features of both the BC's basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, where you have epithelial pearls, pearls and melanoma. So sometimes, you know, you uh, wouldn't put it past your examiners to give you histological slides for you to, um, you know, as a part of your OSCE schedule. So the HE staining of nodular BCC, which is the most common subtype, reveals discrete nests of basaloid cells in the dermis. There's peripheral palisading of malignant keratinocytes and mucinous surrounding stum tumor stroma. So that is, you know, I've taken from one of the sites that we started subscribing to to help our classes. It's called the uh, BioDigital uh, class. So it's uh, a very nice way of going through anatomy. So you can see that these are the mutated basal cells. It is locally malignant. The, the basal cell carcinoma doesn't spread. So it's lying above the stratum bacilli. Right. Uh, no, I can't. Why can't I move this slide forward? So treatment. Uh, risk factors. The features are associated with a low risk of recurrence. The following characteristics has been proposed as features that identify tumors, BCCs that have a low likelihood for recurrence after treatment. So this is the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Clinical Practice Guidelines on cutaneous as basal cell carcinomas. So location and size, less than 10 millimeter in diameter in the M area, and I'll show you what is the M area, cheeks, forehead, scalp, neck, and pre-tibia, more than 20 millimeter in diameter in in the area L, which is a trunk and extremities, excluding pre tibia hands, feet, nail unit, and ankles. Pathology, a nodular superficial histological growth pattern has, has a lower risk. Lack of perineal invasion is also a low risk. And it is, whether it's a primary lesion, not recurrent, well-defined circle borders, no history of radiation therapy at the site, and immunocompetent patients. So that is the H zone where they are more prone to form and uh, the you know uh, you can actually uh, do the Mohs micrographic surgery and stage excision are indi indicated for removal of skin tumors in this area whereas if the light pink area entire scalp and neck are called the M area where you can actually go in for upfront surgery rather than go in for Mohs excision so the treatment options as follows is surgical excision microscope moh s surgery where you excise a bit and you put it under the micro uh, frozen section to find out whether you've taken it uh, uh, all the margins out admittedly that's that is one type of surgery that gives you 100 percent surety cryosurgery where you it's a bit of a problem it's very cosmetically appealing but you do not get a formal histology Curatage and electrodissection used to be practiced, not much of use now. You need a biopsy if you're going to expose a patient to radiation therapy, and you need to take a biopsy from the edge, which includes a portion of the normal tissue. You can use a topical 5-FU and an imicumod 
uh, has been used, but you know, I think the basic most important is surgical excision or most surgery uh, and plus minus radiation therapy for somebody who's very sick and cannot be exposed to any uh, surgical procedure. Okay, so next one. I'm sorry to have to rush you chaps through this, but I'm running short of time. So there we are. Four minutes for this one. Okay, chaps, just before I go, just remember that uh, don't, I hope you haven't missed that tube, that nasogeginal tube, which has been used for this, for this examination. And uh, it's a small bowel ledema. You would do a colonoscopy, ileoscopy, and biopsy, and this was a colonoscopy and ileoscopy. The, the narrowing in the, there was no problem in the cecum, though you might be uh, excused for thinking there's a problem in the cecum out here. It's not. It's actually the cecum has gone up. So there's a narrowing in, so uh, it's a cecum which has been raised up. So uh, that's an area of narrowing in the terminal ileum. And the biopsy showed that it was indeed tuberculosis. So there are two types of tuberculosis that occur, uh, ulcerative and hyperplastic in both types. They may be marked mesenteric lymphadenopathy. Uh, you know that of the two types, ulcerative, you colonize the lymphatics of the terminal ileum, transverse ulcers with typical underbind edges, so the serosa studded the tubercles, caseating granuloma with giant cells, ulcers heat by fibrosis, and uh, uh, may present uh, uh, and uh, may present with uh, uh, later with lumen and narrowing and intestinal obstruction. The answer to your query is yes. It, you could call it a small bowel edema or an enterocrisis. I think it's uh, one and the same. Hyperplastic. When the host resistance has the upper hand over the virulence, so you have long segments of narrowing because there's hyperplasia and thickening of the terminal ileum because of abundance of lymph follicles. As a result of the fibrosis, a shortening of the bowel with the cecum being pulled up into the subhepatic position and resulting widening of the ileocecal angle below 90 degrees. So you have an obtuse angle. So and uh, you know that there is a famous sign called sine D dance as a result of that. Medical treatment, the principle is medical treatment, reassessment with imaging if subacute and style obstruction persists. So uh, if it persists, then you have an option of doing an ileotransfer. Sorry about that spelling ileotransfer is anastomosis if the patient is very ill. Limited resection with ileo ascending anastomosis, stricturoplasty, if a short stricture is present, cutting it uh, longitudinally and stitching it uh, transversely or a formal right hemicolectomy for extensive disease. Um, uh, yes, it's possible to do a small bowel edema in the patient with patent ileocecal valve that is normally patent from up to down. So, uh, and, a tuf and a typhoid ulcer is a typical punched out ulcer without any uh, fibrosis around. If you have fibrosis around, almost certainly it's tuberculosis rather than typhoid, okay? Um, what, what normally the radiologists do is um, give the patient plenty of anticholinergics to um, reduce the movement of the bowel. And therefore, even with a patent IV, uh, ileocecal valve, we can do that procedure. Okay, so next, chaps. So next, Oski. Once you've read it through, I don't think you're going to need more than half a minute to go through that. I'm going to give you some x-rays after this. It was presented an emergency. We found to have this. So half a minute for this one. And the next slot of time after the next one. So I'm going to give you exactly half a minute to go through this one. So these are sets of slides where you have multiple slides. You've got to keep your wits about you. So have a good night's sleep before you are actually going for the exam. Really.
The whole purpose of this exercise is to prime you chaps for your OSCE. Okay. That's the next one. Right. So for a total period of four minutes. There's a diagnosis used. Sorry about that, chaps, you know. Okay, chap, so we go to the answers. Um, obviously, it's a toxic make of colon, the clinical term from an acute toxic colitis with dilatation of the colon. And 1969, that was a criteria that people still follow. Radiographic evidence of a colonic dilatation finding is more than six centimeters in the transverse colon, plus any three of the following, plus any three of the following, fever, more than 101.5, tachycardia, more than 120, leukocytosis, more than, 10,000 uh, of 11 actually, or anemia. Any one of the following, dehydration, altered mental status, electrolyte abnormality, or hypotension. And the pathophysiology is a trans, you have a transmural inflammation. You have a huge amount of nitric oxide synthetase in these patients who have toxic myocolon. And the presence of, you know, nitric oxide is one of the strongest inhibitors of smooth muscle. So the smooth muscle actually dilates if you have plenty of nitric oxide around and you have a neutrophil invasion of the muscular layer and damage. So these are the three pathophysiological changes that happen in a colon. The etiology, you have inflammatory causes, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's colitis, serumembranous colitis, particularly a patient who has pan ulcerative colitis given something like Lomotil or Imodium. But Crohn's colitis actually has a high incidence of formation of toxic nitric colon before it establishes itself sufficiently to cause fibrosis. Infective causes, salmonella species, shigella species, campylobacter, Yersinia species, clostridium difficulty in the model times of antibiotics. It's one of the things, pseudomembranous enterocolitis sometimes lands up with uh, toxic dilatation and sometimes entamoeba histolytic and others. You can have radiation colitis before it causes fibrosis. It causes an end arteritis, and that might actually land up give you patient a toxic microcolon, as does ischemic colitis and non-specific colitis following chemotherapy. So the treatment is medical resuscitation, fluid replacement, NG suction, electrolyte correction, IV broad spectrum antibiotics to cover both gram negative and anaerobes. Stoppage of causal medications like Lomotil and Imodium or uh, Codeine. Consider steroids where the patient has been taking steroids. Cyclosporine A in toxic medical with ulcerative colitis. There are other experimental therapies with infliximab, leukocytophoresis, hyperbaric oxygen, tacrolimus, and IV globulin. It's still experimental, chap, so please do not come out with that as the first line of treatment. Um, so you go ahead with the medical treatment, supportive care, IV antibiotics, appropriate antibiotics, NG tube, plus minus total parental nutrition. You have to give the patient IV uh, proton pump inhibitors, give the patient DVT prophylaxis, rolling maneuver. If with the patient, you turn the patient even to this uh, position that we, are, we love to hate nowadays, the genuine elbow position, and that encourages the gas to come out. So that is it. And you have to give causal treatment. If the patient has ulcerative colitis, so be it. One of the important thing, causal treatment is if it's clostridium difficulty, somebody, some people have tried, and we have tried at CMRI when I was there, we've tried uh, using uh, stool, you know, uh, normal, uh, you give the patient 
uh, a liquidized form of stool down the, the ND tube to, it's called uh, transplantation of normal colonic uh, bacteria. If all that fails, and nobody usually think if you have a perforation, like this patient has a perforation, you cannot wait. You have to go in and do the operation. If there's no perforation, you can initially try for three days. If it's not responding, then are probably a better idea and the patient is deteriorating. Don't procrastinate, go in and do a surgery. Usually it's always a colectomy and a subtotal colectomy. Do not dissect into the rectum. Take off the rectum just at its stop and remove the rest of the colon. If, however, you, uh, the patient is really, and the patient has ulcerative colitis as a causal condition, you may, if the patient can withstand it, do a total private pan proctocolectomy. Uh, the mortality rate without perf perforation is 4%, and if the patient is unfortunate enough to present with perforation, the mortality rate is 20%. So consideration for total colectomies are as follows, refractory disease with failure to medical therapy, evidence of carcinoma, dysplasia, severe hemorrhage, fulminant colitis, not responsive to treatment, a toxic megacolon, I mean, obviously, uh, perforation, the free or walled off, obstruction and stricture with suspicion of cancer, systemic complications from medications, particularly steroids and failure to thrive in children. So that is reason for going in for a total colectomy in a toxic microbiota. Right, so next one. And this is shorter, so I'm gonna give you three minutes. So just giving you half a minute to go through this. Okay, so what is your first diagnosis? What is your differential diagnosis? What will you do for this patient and why? And why does this condition occur? Are there any long-term, long-time, long-term actually, long, not long-time, long-term complications following this condition? So can you please show the previous slide once? Uh, you're supposed to have seen it. So just because this is a trial, heat, I'll go back and do it. Okay? Yes, sir. Right. There you go. Okay, Taps. So what's your first diagnosis? Obviously a right-sided testicular torsion. What are your differential diagnosis? Torsion of the hat at it of morgagne, the extra little um, cyst-like thing that you have, and epididyma orphitis and trauma. What will you do for this patient and why and why does this condition occur? Any long-term complication following this condition long-term? What will you do for this counseling? Telling the patient regarding possibility of infarction and subsequent orchidectomy. You, this is a must. You must, must, must do that before you start your surgery. Uh, and you will also say that the patient uh, operation will be also done on the left side that is prone to the same condition. And you will warn about the long-term complications. So immediate operation, uh, remember that the critical time is about four to six hours. Operation insertion, you levels of the unit are cut to expose the testes and untwist. You do a jabulet procedure, which means you uh, uh, turn the um, uh, vaginal list on itself and a three-point fixation with non-absorbent sutures after orienting the testes. And you know how to orient the testes. The sinus lies lateral. The sinus of the epididymis lies lateral. So post-op analgesia is also important. Why does this condition occur? Inversion, the testes rotated to lie transversely upside down. You sometimes have a high attachment of tenochovaridus, like a clapper bell, and that's a clapper bell. Uh, that's a bell inside uh, a. Uh, that's a the clapper inside a bell. Separation of the epididyme is from the body of the testes. So this there you have a pedicular torsion, which means the testes twists, but the the epididyme doesn't. So 
free reason inversion where the testes are rotated to die transversely or absolutely upside down, high attachment of genocomaginalis, like a clapper in a bell, uh, separation of the epididymis from the body of the testes. So you know, that uh, makes a, uh, the child prone to pedicular torsion. Are there any long time complications following this condition? Yes, reduced fertility and an ischemic reperfusion injury damaging the blood testes barrier may need to add about the formation against sperms. And that sometimes induces reduced fertility, which is why, just like Dr. Ramanuj Mukherjee insisted on telling you that if you have a twisted uh, sig um, torsion of the, the sigmoid, do not untwist it. Sometimes if you have an infarcted testes, do not untwist it. So you don't want a uh, reperfusion injury. Right, so the next, an x-ray will be shown. What is the diagnosis? Where would you find this? What are similar etiological conditions? How would you assess the clinical condition of the patient and outline the treatment of each condition? So we'll give you just about half a minute more because I'm running hopelessly behind time. Poor Dr. Mukherjee will be waiting to start. See, chaps, I told you, sometimes you have to just make a small note on your paper and these are the questions that are being asked so that you don't have to, you, in an examination scenario, you won't be able to go back. That's why we are giving you this trial. Just point form. Diagnosis, where, etiology, clinical condition, treatment. Just keep notes. Right, so there we are. this, I'll give you two minutes. Right, chaps. Right, chaps. Your uh, time's up. So you can see, I mean, because this is an exam, I'm going to point out that's what the defect that we are trying to point out in this x ray. So obviously, it's a bar hole and it's been used to drain a subdural hematoma. So, what are the types of intracranial hemorrhage within the managers or associated potential spaces, which include an epidural hematoma, a subdural? a subarachnoid hemorrhage, an intracerebral hemorrhage, or an extension of a parenchymal bead into the ventricles. That's called an intraventricular hemorrhage. So well, how do you scale it? You use the Glasgow Coma Scale. So uh, this is the Glasgow Coma Scale. And it is, I mean, I recommend an addition to Apache 2 and possibly the SOFA. You have to know the Glasgow Coma Scale uh, in addition to your, uh, you know, all the other scores that you need to know. So this is something that you have to memorize as there's no help for it. Chaps, if you want to take a screenshot of this, I'm not going to go through this because I'm, as I said, I'm running hopelessly behind time. For an epidural hematoma, resuscitation as per ATLS protocol, if you have a GCS 8 or less, you have to go in for an intubation. Evacuation of the hematoma and control of bleeding. Point form, as I said, you don't have time to write an essay in a uh, in an OSCE situation. Subdural hematoma, dual resuscitation, again, intubation of GCS is eight or lower, evacuation of the hematoma if it's increasing, or you can afford it with a subdural hematoma. Sometimes you have a chronic subdural hematoma and you can watch and wait if it's not increasing in size. A subarachnoid hematoma is either traumatic or non-traumatic. In a traumatic, you do a resuscitation and support 
you do an intracranial pressure me measurements and external ventricular drain is sometimes needed. For a non-traumatic, you have to assess for the presence of an aneurysmal bead or an arteriovenous malformation and treat it accordingly. Sometimes you also need an external ventricular drill to preempt the formation of hydrocephalus. Intraparathyroidal hemorrhage, resuscitation and stabilization, control of VP, cessation of antiplatelet therapy, if any, observation, and the options are ports clot, you can do a catheter base dissolution, or craniectomy, or sometimes even a surgical evacuation. So, point form steps. Okay, next question. We are on 13, so uh, go through that, chaps. Give you uh, half a minute to go through this. That should be pre cordial. So. Okay, chaps, so remember what I told you. Sometimes your questions come in two or three slides, so remember that. So this, we will give you exactly two minutes, not four minutes. Okay, Jab, so we go to the question. Uh, he obviously sustained a left flank nerve pulse with a huge elevation of the left pupil of the diaphragm. So uh, basically the treatment is conservative. A number of most of these people, you know, you see his age, uh, you just treat him with conservatively, very rarely requires any interference, breathing exercises and chest physiotherapy. Sometimes, however, the dyspnea is quite serious and you need to do a surgical plication. And if you're doing a surgical plication of the left pupil of the diaphragm, you have, have, and that is very important, you have to use non-absorbable suture material. It could be done open, you could do it thoracoscopic or a laparoscopic, or even nowadays a robotic technique has been used to uh, uh, do this surgery, okay? Um, that's a patient, so that's the next. Sorry about that, that should be a patient, yep. Yep, is there any question? If not, have not four minutes, I'll give you two minutes for that. Okay, Cap, so here we go. Uh, assessment, clinical for, tra for transplant, kidney transplant. Take a full history to identify risk factors for possible future kidney disease, but don't forget that you're going to put him into risk. Exclusion of transmissible diseases and assessment for fitness for surgery and definitely an assessment of hypertension, evidence of end organ damage, either left ventricular hypertrophy or proteinuria, or this patient is on more than two antihypertensive, which uh, should be a relative contraindication for him. And definitely if his BMI is high, if it's more than 35, it's an absolute contraindication. He's going to need both kidneys, so don't allow him to donate. Investigation, you do an urinalysis for blood, protein, and pus. Protein creatinine ratio and midstream urine estimation. You do a blood for complete blood count, urea electrolytes, liver function test, calcium, coagulation profile, flasting of so glucose. You do a virology workup with hepatitis B, C, HIV. You do a cytomegalovirus and then seen bar virus and a syphilis serology also. Do a chest x ray and an ECG and an echocardiogram. Okay. Once that is all right, then you do a renal ultrasound scan and you do an isotope renogram to find out whether his, uh, uh, both his kidneys are working normally. You may even do a CT angiogram provided his urine creatinine are normal. You shouldn't damage the kidney, but 
the whole purpose of the angiogram is not just functional assessment, but also an anatomical assessment because some of the renal arteries break up into small branches before they reach the kidney hilum. So you need to know that. Okay, chaps. So the last, this is 15. caps so we go to the next um, he finds he you, you examine him and you find that he has acting purposes below the right femoral artery so if that helps i'll give you a minute more and then we take the questions take the answers sorry So these are your answers. So obviously, this patient has you take a history of cardiovascular disease, peripheral vascular disease, family history of similar disease, clotting problems. Assess the pulse for a sinus rhythm. He obviously has a clot in his right femoral. So you assess him both from his history and from his clinics. You check the pulse for a sinus rhythm because if he has atrial fibrillation, that will be another problem that you need to assess. Peripheral pulses, including a handheld Doppler. Assessment of both the motor and the sensory status of the right leg. Now, if you find that his sensory is slightly diminished, but his motor functions are fine. So that should tell you that this is an acutely ischemic limb, which appears viable as the motor function is intact and a possible early compartment syndrome because the sensory, there's a bit of a sensory loss. So you would actually go and do an embolectomy uh, and in addition the way you would do an embolectomy is that you could either do it through the femoral artery or through the popliteal artery a longitudinal incision put in a fogarty catheter and drag out the uh, the clot uh, since this patient has needs a fasciotomy as well so you would uh, also put the patient, if you were only doing an embolectomy, you could have very easily have done it under complete local anesthesia. It's possible to do it. Say if you've done a longitudinal incision, you cannot close it up transversely. You have to put in a vein patch to close that gap in either the femoral or the popliteal artery. Now, when you're doing a fasciotomy, the anterior incision is usually placed two finger breadths lateral to the anterior border of the tibia to avoid the peroneal nerve and it gives access to the anterior and the lateral compartment. See chaps, if you're doing a fasciotomy, there are four compartments below the knee that has to be drained. So anterior and lateral compartments and a posterior incision, which is two finger breaths posterior to the medial condyle of the femur and the medial malleolus to avoid the long saphenous vein, giving access to the both the superficial and the deep posterior compartments. Now I've taken this next diagram from Pinterest. So just to help you, you know, that's the lateral fasciotomy. You uh, open both the anterior and the lateral compartments, longitudinally skin and fascia completely slit along its entire division. And the medial fasciotomy, which allows you access if you stay close to the tibia, avoiding the greater saphenous vein and the saphenous nerve, you have access to the deep posterior just behind the, the margin of the tibia and the superficial posterior as well. So chaps, uh, I think Dr. Ramanuj Mukherjee has very kindly agreed to job, join just 15 minutes later. And uh, you might have just a minute to grab a glass of water or something. Thank you, chaps. I think- Sir, why, have... why the patient is having compartment syndrome here, sir? Because of the ischemia, no? Because of ischemia. The patient has come in with ischemia. The muscles are enlarged as a result of ischemia, isn't it? Okay. So the muscles, muscles become atrophied, no, sir, with ischemia. 
slow uh, ischemia causes atrophy. Acute ischemia doesn't cause atrophy, it causes edema, isn't it? You have swelling of the muscles. This is an acute ischemia, not a chronic ischemia. A chronic ischemia, your right, will cause atrophy of the muscles. But a sudden ischemia will not cause atrophy of the muscles. It will, it's an acute ischemia and all the cells within flock and undergo a dilat dilatation. Okay. Thank uh, you. Uh, edematous dilatation.